my name is Jeff Weidenhamer, and the Symposium Against Indifference is sponsored by the College of Arts and Sciences at Ashland University. Uh, it was started in 2003 uh, to be a biennial series of events and lectures dedicated to overcoming apathy in the face of public uh, human concerns by raising awareness and promoting compassionate engagement. Uh, the symposium seeks to engage the university community as well as the Ashland, uh, wider Ashland community toward a deeper understanding of difficult affairs and toward creative personal and corporate responses. Our theme this year is environmental sustainability and We've had a number of reminders in recent months of the timeliness of this topic, uh, from the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, to continuing concerns about climate change. <coughs> um, I want to thank the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, uh, Faye Grun, the Dean, uh, for co-sponsorship of this lecture, and we're delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Bruce Lanfear as our speaker this evening. Uh, Dr. Lanfear is a pediatrician with degrees both in medicine and public health. He is a senior scientist at the Child and Family Research Institute, British Columbia Children's Hospital, and professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. His primary research has been on quantifying and preventing the adverse consequences of low-level lead toxicity. The long-term goal of his research is to prevent common diseases and disabilities in children, such as asthma and ADHD. To quantify the contribution of risk factors, he tests various ways to measure children's exposure to environmental toxicants using novel biomarkers measured during pregnancy and early childhood. Uh, he also designs experimental trials to test the efficacy of reducing children's exposures to environmental hazards on asthma symptoms and behavioral problems. Uh, to the students here, uh, just to remind you that after this lecture, we'll have some time for dialogue with the speaker. Uh, as part of this event, I encourage you to stay for that. Uh, we plan for about an hour for these events, and uh, if you do have to leave early, I just ask that you um, uh, leave quietly on that. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Lanfear and we'll um, hopefully get the technology issue here in hand. So. so one quick disclaimer. I've been a professor of pediatrics for about 20 plus years, but I'm not a pediatrician. I'm a public health doctor. I do sleep with a pediatrician though. <laughs> um, and I have three daughters, so I've learned a lot that way too. Knowing now about the Flint tragedy, I might have been more likely to talk about lead tonight. It would have been easier. But what I really have been trying to understand is why did we have a lead epidemic or pandemic in the first place? And why did we have the tragedy in Flint even though we knew what to do to prevent it? And so what I really wanted to try to do with this talk tonight is to try to understand some of the root causes of why we continue to suffer from, uh, develop diseases because of, and die from things that we know about. Why aren't we doing more to prevent disease? So that's part of what drove this. The other is when I moved to uh, Vancouver, maybe I should talk into the microphone. When I moved to Vancouver, I, I moved there from Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And uh, some of you may know it's, it's easily one of the leading children's hospitals in the country. I had a really cush job, an endowed chair worth 1.5 million. They were going to give me $200,000 to stay every year if I stayed. But they just basically wanted me to bring in grant money. And by this time, we knew what to do. I said, well, I want to spend at least a third of my time translating the science to protect people, to protect children. And the answer was, no, your job is to bring in grant money. So I became a bit disillusioned. When I moved to Vancouver, I was struck by something. Children are healthier in Vancouver than they are in Cincinnati. Now, how could that be? We had one of the leading children's hospitals. I mean, it's the Rolls Royce of children's hospitals. Vancouver Children's Hospital, BC Children's? Yeah, it's a Cadillac, excuse me, it's a Chrysler. It's competent, it's kind of a tired old building. 
but the children in Vancouver are healthier. So there's this kind of a mismatch. And so I, what I was really trying to do is understand how is it that the United States, which by far has one of the leading medical systems in the world, there's no question about that. If you're sick, it's a good place, if you have insurance, it's a good place to be. If you want to stay healthy, move to Vancouver. And there's a few reasons that are pretty obvious. Rates of smoking are lower in Vancouver. Air pollution levels are quite a bit lower. We never had a highway built in this city. It's walkable. There's little mom and pop grocery shops all around. It's conducive to public transportation. Easily half of the people that I know get around by walking, by hiking, or public transportation. And by 2030, the plan is to be 75%. Now that's not gonna be feasible in the short term in a place like Ashland. But the point is that why is why are children in Vancouver healthier? Why is the life expectancy second only to Japan? It's because of all the things we know about from studying public health. And yet, too often, we fail to implement. So I wanted to try to understand that. So what I wanted to do, and this is my first time doing this talk, excuse me. So what I really wanted to do is to begin a dialogue with people, because I don't think no, actually, I know I don't have all the answers. I've got some good questions. I think I have some partial solutions. But I think this is probably one of the most important things we can talk about. Why aren't we doing more to prevent diseases that we know about? So victories in public health, progress or adaptation. And I'll conclude by talking about why that's an important distinction. But first, let me inoculate myself. I'm not here to provide all the answers. I'm here to start a discussion, and I'll try to get through this quickly so that we can actually have a dialogue. I was interested in doing the presentation, coming to Ashland, uh, as I am in hearing your feedback, whether it's critique, which is good. Actually, it's better. If you're just too nice, I don't learn a hell of a lot from that. One of the things that I've realized is that we as a society are entranced by technology. We spend vast fortunes on genetic research, on stem cells. Stem cells that will, by the way, if they ever produce, will benefit a very small number of people. And yet we're spending vast fortunes on stem cell research. Now I'm not bringing this up as a political issue, other than how we invest our money. But we need to think carefully about our love affair with technology. But let me also say that there's some awesome technology. Trains, by the way, are a phenomenal way to get around and much more efficient and much less dangerous than cars. I don't drive anymore, except on occasion. I walk, I take public transportation. So we need to think carefully about the types of technology we become wedded to. One of the other things that I've been struck by is our fascination with medical technology, with new drugs as the solution to our health problems. Every day news of yet another breakthrough in medical science appears as medical researchers unravel another piece of the genetic code where lasers remove brain tumors without cutting into the skull. Now some of this obviously has some benefit, but our fascination with genetics, I think needs to be thought about much more carefully. And I'll provide a few examples. Thanks to the marvels of medical science, our parents are living longer than ever before. How many of you believe that? There's a great truth to it. But let's look at what happened over the past century. What really led to the dramatic increase in life expectancy? Was it adults living longer? Not so much. It was children surviving past the age of 15 that led to the greatest increase in life expectancy. Now, mathematically, that makes a lot of sense, right? If you increase the lifespan of a 65-year-old by 10% at six and a half years, if you increase the lifespan of a child, they live past that vulnerable period of communicable diseases that they used to die from, like TB and typhoid and salmonella. One kid, you get 65 years, not 10 years. 
That's where the numbers come from. Now, what led to that dramatic increase in life expectancy? How many of you want to hazard a guess, or maybe you know? Immunizations. When did, besides smallpox, can everybody hear me? Besides smallpox, when did immunization really take off in the United States? In the 1950s. Look at this. The greatest increase in life expectancy happened before immunization. Not in any way to dismiss vaccines. They were my first love affair as a public health scientist. But it wasn't vaccines so much. And it wasn't antibiotics so much. It was widespread population level improvements in water treatment, pasteurization, better housing so TB wasn't being disseminated, better nutrition. It was broad-based population interventions. Overall improvement of quality of life, access to foods, and so on. Now again, that's not to say that vaccines didn't provide some additional benefit. Of course they did. And antibiotics, of course, can be a godsend if you judiciously, but the greatest increase in life expectancy happened before the advent, largely before the advent of drugs and antibiotics. And yet somehow we've allowed that to be taken over by medical sciences. Now I'm a physician, I'm not somebody that tried to get into med school and couldn't and got a chip on my shoulder. I came with my chip in other ways. I grew up among the poor. But it was voluntary poverty. My parents gave up their wealth and moved among the poor in Chicago on the west side of Kenya. I learned what it was like to be poor. At least I got a glimmer. True poverty is something quite different than living among the poor. But when you see how people are living, how they're striving to do better for them and their children, you realize it's not something that we should blame them for, to be in that situation. So we have benefited some, just if we use life expectancy as one indicator. It's not the only one. You might even argue it's not the most important. I think there's something to that. Five out of the past, five out of the 30 years gained in life expectancy came from medical care. So that's something to be applauded. But has it come about because of progress, steady, incremental progress, always doing better, or is it something different, like adaptation? And by adaptation, what I mean is basically we've continually found ways to respond to things we've done to the environment. So let's take a look. First of all, I want to go back a few centuries. This is probably one of the only data points like this. What happened? in the 1600s that would have led to a decline in the life expectancy from 40 years down to about 30 years in some cases. One more time. I'm sorry, I had a little bit of hearing problems. Uh, well, there were constant wars, so it wasn't specifically wars. No, it wasn't, it wasn't Black Plague. That was earlier. Any other guesses? Moving the city. Moving into cities is a big part of it, and that was tied into the industrial era. In fact, there was something called the urban penalty. In the year 1900, children who grew up, children who were born in the countryside were 30% more likely to live beyond their first year of life than children who lived in cities. Brought all these cesspools together. Remember, there wasn't sewage then. Well, there, was, there, were, there wasn't a way to handle sewage. Were in sewers that diseases became rampant. In some cases, there weren't, there wasn't enough vitamin D. Pollution was happening even back at this point. In London, the London fog began in the 1300s. So, urbanization, industrialization, exposure to pollutants uh, was all part of this. Communicable diseases was all part of it. So, it isn't steady progress entirely. There's a new book uh, called Sapiens. And I've started to read it. Some of it seems a bit of a stretch to me, but his point is that in some cases, people back before the pre-industrial era are doing better than we are. Less tooth decay, less osteoarthritis. Now you can imagine I'm talking about bony stuff. Why is that? Well, sometimes that's the only recorded history we have is bones. Um, 
in the book Sapiens, the author makes the point of talking about how people who were nomadic actually on average only had to work about 28 hours a week. How many of you work less than 40 hours a week? So maybe there is something to this, that it isn't all about progress. There, is, there are some uh, vacillations over time. And I don't mean to point out that I necessarily want to go back and be a Neanderthal. Something's just not right. Our air is clean. Our water is pure. We all get plenty of exercise. Everything we eat is organic and free range, and yet nobody lives past 30. Well, the reason they didn't live past 30 largely was because of children dying at very young ages. Some of the pre our pre-industrial ancestors lived to be quite old, but they were brought down by young children dying. All right, well, let's take one, one stab at it. So these are, uh, based on the Centers for Disease Control, the 10 great public health achievements of the past century. And I think all of those are valid points. But as you scroll down there, are there any that you might say it's adapting to things that we've done to the environment that are man-made problems? Occupational safety. Occupational safety, most definitely. Anything else? Motor vehicle safety. Right. The easy one? Childhood lead poisoning. Yeah. Cancer prevention to, to a large extent. I mean, it's been with us millennia, but we've concentrated exposures in such a way, asbestos, uh, uh, tobacco, and so forth, uh, other types of mining and coke production. Not Coca-Cola, the other coke. All right, so I started the ones that I thought, to a large extent, were man-made, or human-made, I should say, but maybe this is one of those things that the, the women in the audience will say, yeah, the men can have it. <laughs> Tobacco control, motor vehicle safety, cardiovascular disease prevention. William Osler, who was uh, often considered the, the physician's physician, wrote one of the first textbooks in the year 1900, started to see this rare condition increase, angina, heart problems. It didn't used to be a problem. Now the typical thought is, well, people didn't live long enough, but that was also the time when tobacco manufacturing really took off. Pollution was, was rampant. So there's a variety of, of things, and that's not to say that uh, these are only man-made, but they have a large man-made component. Where we can look at it in a different way, this is uh, work published by uh, uh, McGinnis, but put in a, a JAMA publication here, the actual causes of death. So sometimes we think, the act, we talk about the cause of death, well, it's hypertension. Well, hypertension is not really the cause of death. What causes hypertension? Arsenic, lead exposure, tobacco, Obesity, what causes obesity? Is it just people laying on their couches or is it marketing unhealthy foods to children? We know children, if they're marketed products like McDonald's, they have more televisions in their, in their house and they eat two hamburgers and one says McDonald's, they're more likely to, same hamburger, prefer the one that says McDonald's on. So we've allowed our children to be brand, brainwashed by marketing. But the actual causes, tobacco, poor diet, physical inactivity, Alcohol consumption. Alcohol consumption can be beneficial, it reduces heart disease, but for others it uh, increases death. Uh, microbial agents, toxic agents, more vehicle deaths, firearms, sexual behavior, illicit drug use. When we frame it this way, you really see very clearly that much of the disease and disability is man-made. Now I'm not simply saying, oh, it's about lifestyle choices or behaviors. I think that's one of the other fallacies that we've allowed uh, government and industry to push on us. I smoked beginning at age 11 through 24. Why did I smoke? They marketed it to me. No, I'm not bitter about that. It's just the way it was. One of my friends who's at Dartmouth did a really fascinating study, local, regional, national, now it's called global. What they do is they evaluate movies that children saw beginning in elementary school and then following them forward. They would call them at random intervals every three months and ask them about, did you watch any of these movies? And they were randomly generated movies, PG, G, all types. 
And then he had his medical students evaluate how much smoking, total duration and number of times smoking was done in the movies. And he estimated that 50% of smoking initiation among children can be attributed to movie watching behavior, and 30% of children who smoked began from movie watching behavior. That's a little bit hard to believe, but the next time you're watching a movie with somebody, look over at them and watch how mesmerized we are by movies. They're in transit. I have a cousin who used to be a nuclear submarine test pilot. He doesn't watch movies. He said, they screw with your head. <laughs> and they do, that's why they work. So movies can be quite powerful. Uh, the war on cancer, the failure to evolve. What do I mean by that? Let's check it out. Cause or cure, solving cancer. You can't cure what you don't understand. How to cure cancer? How many of you read this book? I think it was 2014 Pulitzer Prize. I didn't finish the whole thing. <laughs> well, I thought it was mesmerized. I thought it was very well written. And it basically romanticized chemotherapy, treatment of cancer with drugs. Now, we can, we can applaud the work that led up to cancer treatments. Leukemia, for example, in particular, 90% of children used to die if they had leukemia. Now it's less than 5%. All right, so that's pretty awesome. On the other hand, the process of being treated isn't fun. Children, on average, lose some cognitive ability, some ability to think. And there is an increase in other types of cancers, secondary cancers from the chemotherapy itself. So one of the things I, I want us to think about is, how many things have really been cured? How many cures are really out there? Antibiotics are an easy one. Insulin is a miracle drug. It's not a cure, but it's a miracle drug. That's great. But how many cures are really out there beyond pulling out somebody's appendix? Antibiotics. There's a few. I'm sure there's a few out there. But over the course of the last 50 years, after these chronic diseases began to arise, we started to understand the risk factors or causes of many of these chronic diseases. And yet somehow, it seems to me we're still fixated on, <coughs> on finding that new drug. When I was down in Cincinnati, it was just at the beginning of the obesity epidemic. And we know what the causes of the obesity epidemic, particularly among children eating unhealthy foods. Maybe it's because they've had less recess. But I think our initial impulse is to blame the kids. It was easier to do bariatric surgery on these morbidly obese children than it was to regulate the food industry. In fact, we still haven't regulated the food industry, and we've been doing a lot of bariatric surgery, basically stapling kids' stomachs so that they couldn't eat as much. That's a solution to a social problem. It struck me as very troubling. And yet we romanticize. There are few known risk factors for childhood leukemia. Now that was true 20 years ago. Here's one example. Pesticides used around the home during pregnancy were associated with about a 50% increase in the development of leukemia in the offspring. Insecticide use, so a very specific type or specific types of pesticides intended to kill insects, was associated with a twofold increased risk. Proximity to highways is another risk factor for leukemia. These are based on meta-analyses where you pull together studies from around the around the country or around the world. Children who live near highways um, in childhood are about 50% more likely develop leukemia. Other risk factors include fraternal smoking, benzene exposure, and in some cases paints and solvents. Now the one thing that we don't really have a good handle on is let's say we eliminated highway traffic and benzene exposure and cigarette smoking among uh, the father and solvents and paints. 
We don't know whether that would prevent 15% or 80%. We just don't know that yet. I'm trying to work with somebody in California where they've got some data on that. Uh, and that would be helpful, but it's not essential. In, in five provinces across Canada, we have banned cosmetic pesticide use. Now, what is cosmetic pesticide use? Pesticides used to make your garden pretty. This was considered low-hanging fruit. It's just to make your garden pretty or childhood leukemia. Which would you prefer? I had a professor down in Cincinnati uh, who really liked the uh, crease in his pants. And he said, well, I think he was a professor of public health, I shouldn't say that. Well, if a few people have to get cancer so I can get creases in my pants, I guess it's worth it. We are making those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis by our inaction. How many people uh, have heard about diethylstilbestrol, DES? A couple. Yeah. <laughs> so diethylstilbestrol was developed as an estrogenic drug in the 1930s. Steroids were thought to be the savior. They were going to solve all our problems, particularly our uh, hysterical women problems. And so this was designed specifically as a drug, and it was used uh, during the 50s and 60s. And the idea was this drug would make your babies bigger. And bigger babies are better, they're healthier. So it was used quite commonly. And then something happened. There was a very rare type of cancer among the offspring, the female offspring of women who took this drug during pregnancy. It was vaginal clear cell carcinoma. And because it was rare, it was a big red flag. What's going on with these women? This is so unusual. They were able to go back and identify it. Now, if it had been something less rare, they may never have found this out. Uh, but they found it out. and. What they've sub subsequently done in a number of studies is to follow up cohorts of women who were exposed to DES in utero when they were developing as a, as a child. And they've compared the exposed women to the unexposed women for a variety of different things. And you don't have to read all these. I'm going to pick out a couple of them. The women who were exposed to DES were twice as likely to be infertile. Three, uh, almost four times more likely to have an ectopic pregnancy. That's when you have an uh, egg begin to develop in the fallopian tube and it's an emergency. Women die commonly from that problem. Uh, spontaneous miscarriage, preterm birth, about five times more likely. That's huge. Five times more likely. Still birth, two and a half. Neonatal death, eight. Early menopause, two and a half. Uh, cervical. Uh, intra-epithelial deoplasia, low-grade uh, carcinoma type changes, but not necessarily cancer, and breast cancer, uh, about 1.8, about an 80% increase. And clear cell adenocarcinoma, this is infinity because it just doesn't happen unless you have that exposure. So here's this estrogenic drug associated with the development of a number of common problems. And yet most of our efforts at breast cancer are about treatment, 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 treatment. So last year, there was another study published looking at as exposure to DDT increased, this is during pregnancy, and now we're looking at the development of breast cancer in the offspring. Young women who were prenatally exposed to higher levels of DDT we're about four times more likely to develop breast cancer, another estrogenic chemical. So we see this pattern now with estrogenic chemicals that should raise red flags, right? Don't do that again. Now DDT, you might say, when did DDT get banned in this country? 60s, we got a 60. Anybody going for a 70? 1970. Uh, this was one of the big chemicals that Rachel Carson talked about in Silent Spring. 
We measured uh, levels of DDT in pregnant women in Cincinnati for our birth cohort. This would have been 2003 to 2006 when we recruited them. 80% uh, of them have measurable levels of DDT. 95% uh, have measurable levels of DDE, which is a metabolite. So even though this was banned three to four decades ago, we're still finding it, was, I find it in most of you. It's a persistent pollutant. Now we could say, okay, well, but we've gotten rid of that. That's good, that's good news. How many of you have heard of BPA or B bisphenol A? A couple of you? That's the water bottle problem, right? Well, do you know what, what BPA was replaced by in some cases? BPS? Do we know that that's safe? Early evidence from the lab says no. Why don't you know that? Proprietary information. So when I try as a scientist to go out and figure out where people are getting exposed, I can't go to the company and say, what do you use in your products? We have to go get cans of chicken noodle soup off the counter or find out if children handling cash register receipts elevates the risk of DPA exposure. So BPA was another chemical designed to be estrogenic, but it was put back on the shelf because DES was so much more potent. So now all of you are regularly being exposed to BPA from canned foods, dental sealants. It's in the air, plastic burns. It's in the air. It's in our house dust. You're all regularly exposed. It's an estrogenic chemical. Should we be worried about that? Yes. There's some evidence that it causes some behavior problems in children, that it increases mammary duct differentiation in rodents, that is consistent with a pattern of breast cancer, and yet somehow we can't regulate that. Until we prove definitively in laboratory studies and in human studies that it's toxic, industry can continue to use it. And we haven't been, done a good job being able to label products either. Just think of the whole GMO debate around labeling. Just labeling. That's it. Just labeling. Still sell it. Just label it. Hard to do. Could you hurry and find a cure for cancer? That would be so much easier than prevention. In two different articles over the past 20 or so years, John uh, Baylor talked about the war on cancer. In 1986, we concluded that 30, some 35 years of intense effort focused largely on improving treatment must be judged to qualify failure. Now, with 12 more years of data, this was in 1997, with 12 more years of data and experience, we see little reason to change that conclusion, though this assessment must be tempered by the recognition of some areas of important progress. And he goes on to talk about a few examples where there has been some benefit. I talked about childhood leukemia, for example, where there has been improvements. Still secondary sequelae, secondary cancers, and so forth, but, uh, but certainly some improvements. Let's look at some of the landmark in cancer preventions and see if there's any pattern that stands out. The PAP test, that was really the first screening test. Evidence linking cigarettes with lung cancer. We've seen lung cancer rates decline quite steeply, not as much as we like. One of the things that's quite interesting, smoking rates are down by 50% in the United States. The number of smokers, about the same. There's a lot more people in the United States. So lung cancer rates are down, uh, especially in men. Women started smoking later, and they're still uh, competing with breast cancer. The link between asbestos exposure and lung cancer, we've still not been able to ban asbestos in this country, but it's not being used. DES associated with vaginal adenocarcinoma, hepatitis B, and a vaccine shown to prevent HPV infection and liver cancer. Helicobacter pylori, <coughs> pylori shown to cause stomach cancer. Anyway, you see a couple things that I think stand out. One is those things that are again are man-made, like cigarettes, like asbestos, like DES, and then the other thing that really stands out is real successes in cancer are those things that are focused on prevention. These are real landmarks. Things like the BRAC gene are certainly important, but it's a fairly rare gene. It's not going to have a big impact on public health. So John uh, 
said, it is now evident that the worldwide cancer research, research effort should undergo a substantial shift towards effort to improve prevention. Now, he said that in 1997. When did Joe Biden make his uh, declaration about spending a billion dollars on the, on the uh, moonshot on cancer, which is largely a treatment driven exercise? Now, again, I don't want to dismiss the need for treatment. If somebody's ill, somebody's sick, and you all know somebody that has cancer, you know many people that have cancer. We, we need to take care of people when they're sick. But it's sort of like this idea, tell pregnant women not to eat mercury, and then do very little over the next two or three decades to bring mercury levels down, so that in two or three decades, we can eat all the fish we want. We're good at the short-term crises, the reactions were not good at long-term planning or strategizing to prevent disease. And John's not the only one. This was a uh, uh, President's Cancer Panel, 2008-2009, uh, I believe, yeah, uh, who also said it was time for prevention. Environmental exposures that increased the national cancer burden do not represent a new front in the ongoing war on cancer. However, the grievous harm from this group of carcinogens has not been addressed adequately by the National Cancer Program. The American people, even before they are born, are bombarded continually with myriad combinations of these dangerous exposures. So we have some panels, some individuals articulating the need to shift towards prevention, but not much is happening. And I'd really like to understand that. We could prevent a lot of disease, disability, and death, but we don't. What's that about? The elusive search for the autism gene. Most of you are quite familiar with the fact that autism has really increased dramatically. Now some of this is undoubtedly shift in the, the way we diagnose kids with uh, mental health conditions. Uh, some of it may be that uh, children are being diagnosed at a younger age. But I can tell you from my wife's own experience, that doesn't account for the dramatic increase. I mean, even over a 10 year period, taking into account immigration from one city to another, change in the, the severity of the diagnosis, diagnosing children at a younger age, there was still a 600% increase. 600% increase. So over the past five or so decades, it's gone from one in 5,000 children this is actually out of date now. It's now one in 68 children. Huge. So what's been our what's been our uh, investment to get to the bottom of this? Oops, sorry, wrong finger. In the first decade of this century, we spent over a billion dollars to understand the etiology, risk factors associated with autism. But one billion dollars of that, or 96 percent was spent on genes, 40 million or 4% on environment. This kind of an increase, such a rapid increase, has to have an environmental trigger. So tell me, why did we spend so much money on genetics? In the end, they concluded that they could account for about 15% of cases of autism. Now that's undoubtedly an underestimate. And, and let, me, let me explain why I mean that. 99% of the genetic studies fail to look at environment at the same time. And if you don't look at environment, you're going to fail to find an association. Let me sh share that with you because I think this gets to this, my concern, some of the, the issues I have with the vast amount of monies we put in genetics. I don't have any problem with studying genetics. Genetics was really, I love genetics, it's cool. But it's the imbalance in the investment. So let's, let's put genes and environment in context. So oftentimes, still today, too often, we tend to think of genes and environment as two separate things. It's like nature and nurture, right? It's that same old argument. Is it nature or nurture? Is it genes or environment? It's both. To be both. So let's maybe frame this a little differently. Um, how many of you are familiar with the term complex diseases? You want to share? What, what's a complex disease? Um, 
multiple genetic factors and multiple environmental factors come together to produce a disease or an epidemic. So for example, there has to be a susceptibility to something for that disease to occur. We're, we're virtually all susceptible to tetanus. Very few people survive tetanus. We're all susceptible. We have an underlying genetic susceptibility. But if you don't get the tetanus, you're not going to die from tetanus, right? So you really, it's really both. When you say complex diseases, it kind of ramps it up because tetanus, we think, is one bacteria and one um, uh, host that's brought together. But for cardiovascular disease, it's not oftentimes just one thing. If you have somebody that smokes but no other risk factors, you're not going to be as likely to get heart disease or die from heart disease as somebody who smokes, is exposed to lead, and has hypertension, is obese, is physically inactive. You see the idea? The cumulative impact is where we see a lot of disease come together. So when we think about genes and environment, there are a few genes, or a few conditions, Rett syndrome, Huntington's disease, cystic fibrosis, that are primarily genetic. And there's a few that are primarily environmental, being hit by a bus in the head, traumatic brain injury if you survive. Right? That's primarily environmental. Yes, there might be some plasticity factors, I'm a little more resilient, but by and large, if you're hit in the head by a bus, it's not a good thing, it's primarily environmental. But most of the conditions we're concerned about, heart disease, ADHD, autism, diabetes, asthma, are complex diseases. That is, they result from the interplay of genes and environment. Now, here's the cool thing about that. Well, I think it's cool. If causes can be removed, then susceptibility ceases to matter. I don't have to understand whether somebody's susceptible or what gene is responsible for autism if I understand what the risk factor is. Does that make sense? I mean, it's cool if you know it. It can enhance what we do, but I don't have to know it. And yet somehow for autism, we're spending a billion dollars on genetics, $40 million on environment. What does that tell us? Why are we so captivated by genetics and by technology? Now, uh, here's the problem with environment. It's hard to talk from doing something about the environment. I'll give you a couple of examples. We did a study that suggested one out of three cases of ADHD in U.S. children, one million children, could be prevented if we eliminated lead exposure and tobacco exposure. Children who had both prenatal tobacco exposure, that is the mom's phone, and were exposed to lead during childhood, one in four of those children met criteria for ADHD. So we could prevent one in three cases. We knew what to do. Got a little scholarly attention, but not much else. Imagine what kind of attention we might have received if I had developed a vaccine or a drug that could prevent one out of three cases. I'd have been able to pocket half of that by the way. I'd be a multi-millionaire. That would be pretty awesome but not much attention. Why is that? This is a uh, MRI of, uh, a composite MRI of children who were exposed to air pollution measured with polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons during, during fetal development and then looked at uh, seven to nine years later. And what it shows on this side is basically a thinning of the white matter, but primarily on the left side. Now this hasn't been associated with autism, uh, but I use it as an example just because it's an awesome photo, isn't it? Uh, to remind myself that there are now a dozen studies linking airborne pollutants or proximity to highway with the development of autism or autistic behaviors. Now these are just in their infancy, but don't forget, we've just started to fund these studies. There's a few other clues to why there's an autism epidemic. Folate deficiency or not taking folate during pregnancy seems to be another risk factor, which is strange because this is all happening during a time when folate supplementation has been going on. So it's kind of perplexing why that might be, unless something 
is diminishing the availability of folate. We know, for example, that women who smoke, women who are passively exposed to smoke, and to some extent women who are exposed to air pollution, they have less folate available to the child. So we may be doing things to the environment even as we are increasing the levels of folate. Or in fact, it may be that part of the reason for the epidemic of spina bifida was because of smoking. Part of it. There's other factors, of course. So we're beginning to have some clues. There's also some evidence that pesticide exposure. Now one of the things about things like aviation, getting back to this idea of these complex diseases, is that they really aren't one thing. Nor is preterm birth, nor is asthma, nor is arthritis. They're variants of asthma, and they're variants of preterm birth. So when we talk about things like autism or ADHD, they're not a single thing. They're really a medley of maladaptive behaviors and deficits. So it may be, for example, with ADHD, that lead causes problems with impulse control and hyperkinesis. Just kids can't stop moving. Tobacco may cause problems with inattention. But when you start clustering those exposures together, you're shifting that child towards that diagnostic threshold. Pregnant women, for example, are exposed regularly to a whole host of things that increase the risk for giving birth to a child preterm. It probably isn't just one thing in many cases. Right, let me get through this so we have some time to chat. So for our toxicologists, um, in some ways we're also learning that environmental toxins or pollutants can play much more of an important role than previously thought. Let me just show you a couple of examples. You're all very familiar with the idea that women who smoke give birth to babies who weigh less, right? Well, this study suggests that it's the women, it's the fewest cigarettes where you see the greatest drop. This is less than five cigarettes a day, and you see this steep drop in birth weight. So it's not linear, and there certainly isn't a threshold that doesn't just happen above this level. The steepest drop is at the lowest levels of exposure, which seems kind of counterintuitive, but we've seen the same thing with lead and IQ deficits. The steepest drop, proportionally, is at the lowest levels. Now that's a little hard to believe, but let's look at an example from Scotland. Following the ban on smoking in public places, among non-smoking women, non-smoking pregnant women, the ban led to a 15% reduction in preterm birth. That's better than any drug out there, 15%. For very preterm birth babies, that is less than 34 weeks gestation, there was a 25% reduction in preterm birth following the ban on smoking in public places. Little things can matter a lot. We've also seen the same pattern with air pollution or cigarette smoke, really steep increase in the risk of dying from heart disease at the very lowest levels here, and that starts the plateau. Now what do we do with air pollution? We assume there's some threshold or acceptable level, and we ratchet it down from let's say 15 to 12 microgram per cubic meter, clap ourselves on the back and say, yes, we're making progress. But if we really wanted to make progress, this would suggest we got to get down really far. Over 90% of the world are exposed to levels above 10, which would be represented about here. So we underestimated the impact. We are underestimating the impact of air pollution on premature death from heart disease. Now just think about that. I don't need any more genetic studies. I don't need a new drug. You know what to do. Sorry, we're not going to do it. It's not important. Now, it would cause us to shift the way we live, wouldn't it? We might have to use public transportation more. We might have to smoke less. But we know what to do. Benzene and leukemia. Benzene, for a long time, almost 100 years, has been known to cause leukemia. But it's actually not benzene that causes leukemia, it's the metabolites of benzene. What happens here is at the low levels you see a steep increase in the risk of leukemia, and then it plateaus. Why is it plateau? The reason is thought to be because we're no longer able to continue to break down the benzene. Our enzymes that break down benzene are saturated, and so we're not producing the toxic chemicals that lead to an increased risk of leukemia. Now that's a bit of speculation. We don't really know why but it seems to make good sense. All right, I want to shift a little bit and just talk about, 
What about the cost savings? A lot of us are concerned about the cost of health care. If we look at cost savings, almost 50%, I don't know what that dollar amount in there is, almost 50% of environmental or population level interventions are cost saving, compared to about 13 to 60% of clinical or person directed interventions. Does that make sense? It's costly. You have to customize your care to every person. As opposed to, for example, so if I, I can say, well, I need to spend five minutes with everybody to try to do something about obesity. Good luck, because if you don't change the environment, it's really, really hard. Or we could say you can't sell soda more than 12 ounces in size, or maybe it should be five. I don't know what it is. That would affect everybody. When they've done that in a school, they, they shifted the soda machine by random assignment. Over two years, there was a 10 pound difference in the children who went to the schools without soda versus with soda. 10 pounds over two years. Phenomenal, right? But where do we put most of our effort? Schools now, in some cases, they're relying on the kickback from these soda companies. I don't know if that still happens. That was a problem five years ago. All right, and how much do we spend on medical care treatment versus public health prevention. 96% of our health care, excuse me, our health dollars are for disease care, medical care, and less than 5% for public health and prevention. So, isn't it time to give prevention a chance? Over the past 50 years, we've begun to recognize some important risk factors for death, disease, and disability. They're not a mystery anymore. We don't have to wait for people to get sick. One of my favorite quotes these days by a Nobel laureate, Daniel Kahneman, we can't live in a state of perpetual doubt, so we make up the best story possible, and we live as if the story were true. In a time when we didn't know what the causes of chronic disease were, it made sense to put our promises to treatment, to finding the cure. Now, we know many of the causes of what kills us, what maims us, what kills our children. We know much of it. And yet the story hasn't changed. The narrative is broken. So now I'd like to uh, invite all of you to critique, comment, discuss. We do have a microphone, which is great because as I've said, I'm a little hard of hearing. But I would like, I would like to hear some dialogue. This is, um, for me, this is a beginning. I think this is what I want to do for the rest of my career, is to try and help figure out why we're not acting on what we know. And if I don't have some good feedback, I'm going to fail, I'm sure. I might fail anyway. This is, a, this is like a 100-year journey, right? But why not? What's to lose? Um, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. I appreciated it and found it very um, uh, inspiring. I, I noticed that you brought up some of the differences between uh, the culture in terms of more um, space for things like public transportation, et cetera, in Vancouver than um, in some of the places in the United States. And I think, in part, this um, issue is one of culture. When you think about profit, um, capitalism, um, a, a sort of deep-rooted individualism, you know, not wanting the government to interfere, et cetera, which I think we're all familiar with, but really running against a barrier. Um, how can we how can we address that in your view, or what are some ways that have been successful that you have seen that addressed? Well, it's a great question, and I don't think I have a, a simple solution, other than where I see a greater receptivity is among younger people. Uh, I think traveling to other places. When my nephew did an exchange in Norway, my brother was a little bit bothered by it. He said, maybe he should have gone to Africa or India where they really you know, could learn something. And I said, you know what? We can learn a whole lot from Norway. Norway, for example, 
taxes oil and natural gas reserves like at 70 percent and they put that away so now they've got a trillion dollar pot of money and you know what they're investing in it renewable energy we charge actually we give money to the oil and gas industry in this country so i think maybe seeing how other cultures do it um, i think exposing some of this um, in some ways we have exposed the oil and natural gas industry, we've, been, we've exposed others. I don't think we've talked enough about medicine, and, and I think there's good reasons for that. We, we all want to trust our physicians individually. Sometimes we get critical of the system, uh, but we haven't questioned the biomedical research industry as much as I think we should. It's, it's prone to some of the same problems. So those are the only two solutions, but maybe we could open it up to others. I'd say uh, Max Planck, uh, physicist, uh, talked about how science progresses. You know that quote? Yeah. <laughs> One funeral at a time. Sometimes you got to let the old guys die and a new culture emerge. Um, but maybe we shouldn't have to wait that long. So other thoughts about how we could accelerate some of this uh, adoption of practices that seem to make more sense in some ways. Any other ideas about that? One of the things I've noticed, only two of my, no, only one of my three daughters uh, has a driver's license. They don't really need it in Vancouver. That would be different, of course, in Ashton. They would be reliant on it. But I, I, mean, I can't imagine. 15, I was ready to go get my license. Everybody that I grew up with, my 15 or so, I, I grew up in a little country in Iowa, is going to go get their license. So there is some shifts, uh, but it's going to take some time. What's your plan for changing people's behavior? Changing the environment. How do you change the behavior by changing the environment? So one of the uh, one of the points that Jeffrey Rose makes. So if you like these some of these population concepts, uh, Jeffrey Rose's book, A Strategy for Prevention. He's dead now, but this was uh, 1993. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was because his strategy failed. He just got old. Uh, one of the things he points out is that if we try to change behavior for the few people who are sick, have hypertension, heart disease, don't smoke, don't eat all the food that everybody else is eating, then it's really almost impossible. Besides being too late, the real, the real solution then is to try to encourage better eating, less smoking, more physical activity across the board. Now, how do you do that? Well, we, we tend to focus on, again, individual behavior. But the idea is that you make the environment, you change the environment to make it harder to become sick. Right now, what we've done, because we've allowed corporations basically to dictate policy, is that we've made it extraordinarily easy to become sick. You have to really work hard, and many of us do not to become fat. It's hard. So what could you do? Well, if you had public transportation, for example, there was a randomized study where they gave uh, people um, for three months an option. Me, they randomly assigned people to either do three months of car share programs and use public transportation or continue to use their own car. Eight pound difference in weight loss. Now you might say, well, that's so inconvenient. I walk a lot. I like it. Uh, eating at home more. When you go out, you're invariably going to eat more calories. When one of these talks I did similar to this, somebody said, well, it's so inconvenient. You get home, you're tired. And that's one story to tell you. So that's one narrative. I've got a different one. When my wife gets home, I have a gin and tonic. I'm the sous chef. She cooks. We cook together. We catch up on the day. It's a nice day in the day. So it's part of the story we tell ourselves. The question is, who's dictating our culture? Right now, we have largely a consumer-driven culture. What's going to make your life good? Well, if you're a young lady, you look sexy, you got great makeup, boots up to here. Our culture is, to a large extent, driven by marketing, by the interests of corporations. And we allow it in Quebec. Sweet. They ban marketing to children. That would be harder to tell to do here. 
but that's the solution. So when I said it's a 100-year journey, it is a 100-year journey. But what I learned from my dad, he said, you want to make a fundamental difference, basic change, and change. But those are the kind of things I think we need to do. Make it harder to become sick. And we, we have some good ideas about that. The commute that people have to do. You should exercise after your work. Right? Well, what if you have an hour and a half commute each way? That's a little hard. So we've made it difficult for people to be physically active in some cases. So I don't get have all the answers, but I think it really comes down to focusing more on the environment and stop thinking it's always about the individual. Yes? So what do you do with the tobacco industry? And there are a lot of economists. Well, what would I do or what did the U.S. government do? <laughs> I would tend to follow Uruguay's suit. Um, and they've, they've literally banned it. Uh, I'm not sure we really want to go down the way of, of prohibition. Um, but I think making it extraordinarily expensive. Basically, you pay for the long-term costs of tobacco. Getting tobacco out of any kind of marketing, and we tend to think it has been to some extent, um, forcing states to get the tobacco settlement money to put that towards tobacco control. Now, could I do that? No, I'm not a politician. I mean, I can't even tackle lead poisoning to be successful. But those are the kind of things that we need our leaders to do. Um, we have, you know, we've seen in this country that it's about to decline and now it's about to rise again. With e-cigs, you mean? Well, other lives as well. And so we see that we've been ineffective with something that we know and have known for a long time yeah. is increasing risk for multiple illnesses. Yeah. I, you know, several of the things we're talking about, it really comes down to um, having a better, well, regulating the mega corporations um, so that they aren't harmful. And corporations, of course, can do wonderful things. They can make our lives better and so on and so forth. But when we've given them too much power and when they control uh, the airwaves, when they control marketing to children, when they control our politicians, it's too far. And until we start to get a handle on that, I think it's going to be difficult to do much. Um, but the only way that's going to happen is that we get together. And this, again, where I see change, it's going to be young. So you guys got a lot to deal with. It. Fix it. Fix everything we screwed up. So let's say in the perfect world, yeah. we can do all the environmental change and money and efforts, and everyone agrees. So we take away the 50% or whatever percentage it is that is environmental, and we leave the genetics. What do we see at the end of that? Is there, I mean, if, if indeed the genetic predisposition is strong enough to be a 50% contributor, we're still going to have, we'll probably save money in the long run, extend life for a percentage of the population. But if we were really able to make all those control of the environment, and everyone's behavior has changed. What was it then? Yeah, well, we're still going to all die. Yeah. <laughs> so that's um, I think the best we can hope for is to compress morbidity, that is to have more healthy years um, of life. Um, I think, I think one, let, me, let me see if I can frame it this way. Many of the genes that we evolved serve a purpose. And there's a great example. There's a, uh, a gene called the monoamine oxidase type A uh, gene. And it's an X-linked gene. So females have a pretty good chance of getting one of the two X's. Males, 40% of males lack this gene. This gene has been associated with violent behavior, aggressive behavior, criminality. That be 40 percent of males lack this gene and it's associated with those kinds of problems it doesn't make sense but it's only a problem if those children who lack if those males who lack the gene were maltreated or 
physically abused. Well, why does that make sense? Well, think about it for a minute. All of you guys watching Game of Thrones? Imagine males growing up in that environment. It's a very abusive environment. People are killing each other all the time. Now, in that situation, us geeks who sit there and think things out, we're not going to allow to ask very long, are we? It's the, it's the young men who realize through all this violence that the waiter who saw things, off with his head. So in that situation, it's actually a protective gene. So I think the real, the real issue is we have brought so many new stressors into our environment in a very short time. We have evolved over the course of thousands of years, but now we've introduced all these chemicals, for example, in a very short time, things we didn't evolve with. So we don't have genes to protect us. So that's kind of a simplistic way to think about it, but um, again, I think the best we could do is live a few more years longer. I don't want to live too long. 90s plenty. I was starting to think, I, I don't know if any of you have taken the lifetime calculator. I did it last year. And uh, it said, I'm going to live, good chance I'll live to 92. Damn, what am I going to do? I wanted to retire at 60s so I could go take pictures of lichens and hike and kayak. But then, if I might live to 92, that's a long time. So I don't want to live forever. But I'd like to be able to kayak and hike until I die or close to it. That's what I'm going and I'd like to see a lot fewer people die prematurely, and a lot fewer children suffer from mental health conditions. And whether we can shave off 20%, 30%, um, it doesn't so matter so much what the overall proportion is, but we should, we should do it because we can. Please join me again for uh, expressing appreciation to Dr. Landry.